going to be kind of a long one as well. We're going to be going over disaster recovery and business continuity in the cloud. So this is another one of those where you're going to want to pop some popcorn and hang back. This is going to be a long, long one. So here we go. We are going to take a look at business continuity and disaster recovery. There's some benefits of cloud-based or offsite backups. I, seriously, I'm a big fan of this one. So there's a lot of things you can do here in terms of making sure that you are ready to go in terms of your cloud architecture and how it works for making sure that you can keep on going regardless of what happens, right? You can evaluate the risk of various threats, steps to mitigate them, discuss the role of co-location for continuity, identify and discuss a variety of system threats, benefits of a cloud-based voice over IP system, especially for servicing customers, especially if you're healthcare, right? Describe the benefit of cloud-based data storage for continuity, testing, auditing, and business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Make sure you're testing this on a regular basis and then go ahead and create that business continuity and disaster recovery plan. So this is all about the survival of the company if something bad happens, right? And things bad happen all the time. You know, right now, you know, we've got bad things happening all over the world. That means you need to, as a security engineer or as a cloud engineer, make sure that you are pretty much so good to go um, if something fails. Now, we do have physical problems, right? There are, will be physical things that fail. We'll have power that fail, we'll have disk drives that fail, we'll have CPUs that fail, RAM fails, servers blow up, racks catch fire. Um, you've got everything, fire, flood, theft, power surges, everything can blow out your disks. So you want to make sure that you're sto storing on more than one disk or that you're using some kind of RAID striping system along the way, right? So there are things you can do. And again, over time, we kind of learn how they go. Now there's actually a mathematical formula called mean time between failure. And then there's one called mean time before failure. So make sure that you kind of understand how these works. So mean time between failure can be like eight years, but eight years is just the mean time. That doesn't mean that something won't last 10 and that means something won't last one minute in your system, right? So it's important you understand how this is done because they're gonna run 100,000 or 1,000 disk drives and then they'll go, okay, these all failed at this point and we'll just say, here you go, boom. This is, we'll note the time, we'll say, okay, it's after this amount of time that something fails. So this is all theory. So again, something may have a manufacturer's defect that you don't know about or something else may happen. So you really do want to make sure that when you're doing your data systems that you're doing stuff to make sure that you don't fail or that if you do fail, you've got a backup of the data. So manufacturers do some math and then it's important to note that no device in the group ran anywhere near 5,000 hours, right? They'll actually just do some math and the math is theoretical. It's not necessarily rooted in the real world. It's just kind of an abstracted model that says, okay, well, it should last this long because we built it out of these components. Doesn't mean it's going to, right? So if you want to reduce disk failure threat, right, and these are things that your cloud computer provider is going to do, these are the things you should do in a co-location center or in your data center, make sure that you have up-to-date disk backups, right? Now, if you're doing this via virtual systems, that's pretty easy. You can do a snapshot schedule on that and go from there. You can do RAID, you can do any kind of, of RAID on this one to see if a disk fails, company can replace the disk and restore from backup, or just make sure that the data is actually using RAID on something else along the way. That implies, of course, that the disk is just the disk failure, right? And that you didn't burn your data center to the ground or, or uh, melt your data center to the ground or flood your data center around, or someone didn't just come in and break into your data center and steal all your, your hardware, right, for copper or whatever. So make sure that it didn't damage that disk backup. And this is where the cloud actually becomes a really interesting solution for you um, to do those kind of backups on. Actually, back up to the cloud makes the little things a little bit more interesting from that recovery process. So to reduce risk, most companies store their disk backups at an off-site storage facility. We all have heard of Iron Mountain. They do it on tape. But do we really test those backups? No, not really. I've heard more than one company, oh my gosh, the, the things didn't work. Where tape backups didn't work. Uh, we were able to get our backups in time. Something else happened. The cloud can take care of a lot of this for you. Right. Again, if you're working in the cloud, you've got snapshots, you've got guaranteed uptime and service level agreements with your data in operating in buckets and all the other things that go along with it. Um, I would much prefer using the cloud as my main way of dealing with business continuity and disaster 
threads and everything else. So Iron Mountain, we all use Iron Mountain, everybody does. It's just basically disk or tape storage. They come, they pick it up, they take it off to a place, and then you request it when you need it back in case something fails. Pretty standard there. Um, they do document management. They started doing cloud-based automatic backups, which is nice. Records and management storage, including health records, and again, whether it's paper or not. Secure document shredding. They do an awful lot of neat things, but the big one is they've started moving to cloud-based automatic backups. The thing is now you have to have Iron Mountain software installed on your, on your servers. You may not want to do that. It depends on how much you trust Iron Mountain and your data then you're going to trust them anyways if you're giving them tape backups of everything too. So this is where you run into perception problem. So you do have a disk replacement, the problem, right? The problems with remote tape backup system is that it takes time. And the tape backups are pretty notorious for not working exactly the way you want them to work when you want them to work, right? So you'll need to test those on a regular basis because it's really easy to break the tape backup system. It is really easy to break it, right? To start, the company may need to purchase a replacement disk. Um, you need to install and format, and then finally you've got to go to the company's tape storage and return that tape that contains the data. So you may not even know what disk failed. So again, RAID will help out here on a lot of this. But the other thing too is making sure you've got replacement disks. If you have all the replacement parts you need, you may not. And then someone in the company has got to install and format the disk for use. So there's time here, right? There's time. It may take however many time it takes to do this. The larger the disk, the longer it takes to format. So if you have a two terabit disk, that's one thing. If you're doing SSDs, that's completely different. You don't really format those. So it depends on what you got and where all your data is. So I prefer RAID. RAID is a big way of solving problems for disk drive failure. So there's no file to recover or anything else. You're using RAID 5 or RAID 0 or something else along the way. So you're storing your data across several drives along the data that can be used to reconstruct the file if one of the drives fail. However, comma, if you use RAID, and you use it with, with just a two-time backup. If you have a one terabit NAS, um, you really only have 500 gigs available to you because I'm making two copies. If I make more than that, then that reduces the capacity of my NAS from storing data. So you have to provision correctly. Now, the cool part is that if you're in the cloud, the cloud will do all this for you automatically. You're already going to get one terabit of data, then somewhere in the cloud there's one terabit backup. So if something fails, it all happens transparently to you because of the way they set up their backup and continuity processes in case an entire array fails. Now, doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean you still don't need to architect for disaster recovery, business continuity, multi-zone, multi-region, all the other things. It just means that your data via SLA probably has a backup somewhere, if not one, at least two or three along the way. So that if something happens to your primary bucket and you won't even notice this, then they can pull a fresh copy of that data down from some other place. So if you buy one terabit out in the cloud, one terabit is what you get. If you have a local network attached storage in RH5, if you buy one terabit, 500 gigs is what's really available to you because of the way you implemented RAID. That's the thing you need to remember about this. When you're doing disk failure systems and you're doing local versus cloud, understand how this works. Cloud-based storage gives you the full amount of data that you need and gives you some SLAs, service level agreements, around how that replicated data is going to move around the network, where it goes, and how it goes. This causes problems for jurisdiction. This covers problems for privacy and other requirements. If you don't know where that replicated data is going, you could have jurisdictional issues, which means you'll have legal issues if you're in a place that has a restrictive jurisdiction. So you have to be really aware of that too. There's a lot of catches to this, right? It's really, really cool if you can do it, but there's a lot of catches to this. So cloud-based data backups are really neat because you can you know, just go ahead and put them out there wherever the cloud data center is. You can do a multi-region, multi-zone, or however you want to edit this thing to make it work for you and architect and design it, and then just be up and running, right? You can always have a hot site going um, and actually keep it working so that if something bad happens, you're always up and running. And that is really one of the interesting things about cloud-based data backups 
is depending on what you need and how you architect it, those backup files can be immediately available from any device anywhere. So they reduce any potential downtime because no need is needed to find, retrieve, and restore a tape backup from a traditional backup storage facility or from any other place. It's there, it's online, it's ready to go the minute you need it. If you are architecting well, you're actually not even going to need to do a lot of things on that cloud-based data backup because you're actually going to be running a replicated synchronized site across multiple regions, right? So if a region goes out, you've still got at least one or two other regions for your high availability, high performance computing solution and the things that you need to have. So that's the thing. Depends on how you architect it. The other one I think is interesting too is power threads. If you're in the cloud, you may not need to worry about this unless something bad happens like World War III. Right, so EMPs, anything that was big enough to take out the grid will take out one of the big major data centers, and even then that's kind of questionable, right? So when a computer loses power, everything that's unsaved data is lost. An electrical spike can permanently damage computers' electronic components. So there are threats to power, but if you are in a large data center, you are running some seriously conditioned power, you are running off of diesel generators, you are doing a lot of things that you don't have to worry about. If you architected for high availability, High capacity system you are running in multiple zones multiple regions so even if a region blacks out even if you have a tidal wave come in your company's still moving you don't have to worry about it unfortunately power brownouts can be quite common especially in summertime especially and depending on how much air conditioning and other things are going on things to watch out for things that will impact your local data center that may not impact the cloud because the cloud has got a different set of rules and different set of policies around it. And again, much more money to go into it. Again, the, just the purchasing power of Amazon or Microsoft alone for this can really make a huge difference in how they provision their data center. Now, most of us will be buying some kind of UPS though. Each rack in your data center should have its own uninterruptible power supply. So you have enough time to turn off all the servers in there. So servers can, users can save their work or servers can save their work or shut down in an orderly way that doesn't cause damage to the actual server operating system or something else. Doesn't mean still things won't happen. It just it's kind of a stopgap area in there to kind of make your life a little bit easier. Every data center I've ever been to has got some kind of power generator, whether it's diesel, gas, or some of the newer ones I think are kind of neat because they're all running off of solar. Solar, I love those with a big, huge battery rack, you know, a 1,000 or 100 kilowatt battery rack that goes along with it. It's kind of neat. So these will provide power in the event of a long-term outage. So these are things that you don't have to worry about because they're going to be part of your cloud solution because the cloud provider will provide this or you will need to worry about this because it's your data center. Depends on where you're at. So cloud-based power loss risk mitigation is going to be something that you are going to have to architect for, right? And again, that's multi-region, multi-zone. So you don't need to buy a lot of things. You just need to make sure that your architecture across your, your infrastructure as a service, you've dealt with how you want to do it in case the entire zone or region goes out. So remember, providers can share infrastructure costs across many customers, so you really don't pay a whole lot. And you can also speed up customer service while you're at it. If you architect correctly, a lot of these issues to go away, right? You can survive a lot of things that go along with it. Just make sure you're architecting correctly. Now, this one's really kind of interesting because computer viruses are everywhere. You can get them from just about anything, depending on where you go. Your cloud image is just as susceptible as anything else that you do in your own data center. So if your system administrator is surfing bad websites from a cloud server in the cloud computing environment and gets a virus and you don't have anti-malware, antivirus on it, that's a problem. Ransomware. Ransomware works just as good in the cloud computing environment as it does in a regular network environment. So you've got to be careful about how you do these things, right? Because things happen. It's estimated in the United States alone that you know we've got computer viruses, downtime, lost productivity, 10 billion a year. It's a lot of money. And not only that, that's just lost productivity. It doesn't include anything about recovery. It doesn't include anything about a ransomware where you have to pay the ransom for if you didn't have good backups, right? So while most antivirus solutions automatically update themselves often as every time you boot up or often daily, 
Um, that doesn't mean that they're 100% effective. Most antiviruses are only about 80% as effective, and it's really easy to alter the signature of any virus or anything else along the way. Firewalls will help you out, right? Home computer users, we all should be doing some kind of firewalling. You get firewalls in the cloud, you should be using them. You get firewalls at work, you should be using them. And again, this just makes it easier. I really do recommend some kind of application firewall as well, not just at the network layer, but at the application layer as well, because that will make your life a whole lot easier for things that are inbound. And I would want to have a big industrial level inbound application firewall. I really would. I would want one on my cloud. I would want one on my in-home data center. And I would want to have at least some kind of system between the user and the internet, and whether that's proxy or something else that goes along with that to make sure that life's a little bit easier for my security people and the things that we need to do. There are some other virus protection um, steps that you can do. The biggest one is making sure that users can't install software. So that sounds kind of interesting but it's really interesting how many people can install their own software and that's everyone that includes your security team now the reason why you don't want your security team just randomly downloading and installing software is because if they have the ability to do it they may get a drive-by right we can work from a virtual box we can do some virtual desktop virtualization to go along with this right but again the big thing is make sure that you can't install software on the main on the main computer that, that your user is using so not only does it reduce the chance of a computer virus, it also will help kind of slow down or stop um, ransomware. Ransomware will work a little bit differently. It usually works off a of zero day. It won't stop it completely, but it does make some things a little bit harder because users can't install software. So even if the user account becomes corrupted, they can't just go in as the user, download software, and go from there. So you've got to take care of that. That's number one. The other one I like too is turning off USB. Right? No one needs USB anymore. Not at work. Not with the cloud. Right? And then train users not to open email attaches because phishing happens. Ransomware happens. Phishing is huge. Right? I get phishing emails almost every day from, from all over the place, not just in Google, but at work. It's really kind of funny just how many people want to have that report right now, and my boss really wants it right now, and my boss is screaming for it, and my boss I know is out of town. He doesn't want anything. He's at a beach somewhere. He's having a great time. Right? He doesn't care about work. So you have these things. Just train users not to open email attachments um, and all the rest of it. So fire, fire is another one. Um, fire, whether you're in the cloud or whether you're in your own co-location or whether you're in data center, you're going to have sprinkler systems. And you know the interesting part about sprinkler is water and electricity don't really mix. You get big sparks. Lots of bad things happen. There used to be some things like halon. A halon will suck all the oxygen out of the room. That's bad for humans. CO2, that's also bad for humans. So you've got to kind of balance which way you're going to go, whether how this is going to work. But even just smoke damage, right, will cause problems. So most data centers have an automatic fire suppression system that is generally water-based or CO2-based. Um, so you really want to make sure that they work. You can't test them. They're only going to test out. They're only going to work the way you need to. You can have them checked every year or every quarter, however much you want to. But again, most of these are going to just destroy the computers when they deploy. And the idea is that it's easier to replace the computers than it is to replace the building and all the other infrastructure on it. But either way, there's no good way to protect your data center or your office software other than just simply insure it against fire, flood, theft, damage, and all the other things that we would insure against. Fire is kind of a tricky one. There's a no-win scenario on that one. And again, Halon, if you run into Halon, you won't run into these now because it does suck all the oxygen out of the room and they decided that this is a human issue, but you may still see them out there. So if you do have a Halon system, just be really aware that you won't be able to breathe if it ever goes off, right? And it does literally suck all the oxygen out of the room. Be really aware of that. Then you've got some other fire suppression. If your house or data center in the cloud, your system resides in state-of-the-art data center. So again, if you have in the cloud and the cloud region or zone data center burns to the ground, if you're on a platform as a service or infrastructure as a service and you have architected for disaster recovery, business continuity, you will keep on moving. You will never notice a problem with it. If you did not, then you'll have a problem. You'll be a number of 138 companies that went out of business here in Seattle because they didn't architect well when, uh, when a co-location facility burned to the ground. Again, you can architect your way out of a lot of these things. 
right? Just by doing multi-zone, multi-region. Floods, this is gonna become more and more of an, uh, of an issue as the global temperatures change. So a lot of the data centers, especially in a place like Virginia, um, Amazon's got a big presence in Virginia. There's a couple that are in Dubai and UAE that are really close to uh, floodplains or flood levels. And why they built them there, because there's already access to water, at times there's too much water. So you have to pump it out. If those pumps ever fail, then those data centers are gonna flood. With Virginia, you often get hurricanes. So hurricanes will alter that flood because you will sometimes get storm surges of up to 30 to 40 feet above normal. So again, you're gonna have flood sensors in the floorboards um, underneath the computer decking. You'll have a flood sensor in there that will sound an alarm if water is detected, um, but they won't detect widespread flooding. You're gonna be wanting to watch um, for that. So if you have a standpipe in the roof, look for discoloration in the roofing tiles or look for dripping water on the floor um, because that may not trigger the alarm but you're going to want to make sure that that you're not getting an on-site pipe leak or that the roof isn't leaking All right so there's things you need to just watch for and again these are just things as you get into security you'll walk into walmart and you'll count the number of cameras in the ceiling that are actually monitoring you get used to looking and observing for things that could be wrong so when you get into floods and you get into water leakage, you're gonna be looking for discoloration in the tile, you're in the ceiling tile, puddles of water on the floor. If you hear an odd sensor coming from the under underfloor, you're gonna pull the floor up just to see what's leaking under there. You'll probably find someone's lunch because they make great refrigerators as well. Data centers are great for that. So lots of interesting ways of handling water. It's just more of an observational thing. And then this is my favorite one. Disgruntled employees we could talk to or talk about all day long because they exist. There's always someone that's cranky about your company. We just covered some of that in the security module. So it's very difficult to defend completely against an angry employee, especially one who has physical access to systems. So if your system administrator goes bad, if your network administrator goes bad, or your security engineer goes bad, it's gonna hurt. So you need to make sure that there's redundancy in how you architect the roles that people apply in. So your security engineer should never be able to bring down the whole company and then be able to get to the backups, right? Your system administrator should never be able to bring down the whole company and have access to things that they don't need to have, like security components, right? So you can do things on that level, but you can also do things, especially for delete, every one of your cloud providers have something called MFA delete, which means you have not just a single sign-on, but if you want to delete an object, you have to approve it by using multi-factor authentication. You can also do versioning of an object, right? Those versions can go into a different storage and infrequent access or a glacier or cold storage. So you always have some kind of object permanence going on, as long as you have a data lifecycle to go along with it. Huge huge, huge way of making sure that if they're, even if they do MFA delete, you've at least got some kind of copy that's at least some kind of recent. So there are things you can do here from the procedural side, from the architectural side, and just from the security side to make sure that you are taking good steps and really common ones, really just kind of logical ones against disgruntled employees. The other one, lost equipment. And again, this is why I use burner phones and, and strip down computers when I travel. Um, there, it, chances are it's gonna get stolen or chances are that, especially with what I do, um, I've had my computer taken at, at an entry point more than once. So when an employee loses a notebook, it's not just the computer, but it's any local data on that thing. So you should be running all kinds of security, all kinds of BIOS login, all kinds of multi-factor factor logins and everything else. The interesting part though is our cell phone. Right. So we actually have a pretty powerful device that we walk around with everywhere all day long. It's in our back pocket. It's really easy to lose. It's really easy to get stolen. Right. So phones also need to have remote wipe. You can get remote wipe for your notebook computers and everything else. So given the amount of information that we store on devices, um, identity theft often follows the device of a theft. So having something like remote wipe is a really big, big, big boon. You can do that through just about any of the user interfaces for the phone, whether that's Android or whether that's Apple. Just make sure you've enabled remote wipe on everything that's portable, right? Whether that's a notebook, a phone, anything else along the way. Just be prepared for it. So if someone brings, if so you get your notebooks taken by border agents, um, that remote wipe makes for a really interesting problem. But then it becomes a company problem, it becomes company legals problem, and you're out of it, you're good. So just make sure that that kind of happens, right? Now, 
risk of lost equipment again, data loss when the device is lost or stolen. So make sure that it's all backing up to the cloud. Anyways, you can lose a little bit of data. You don't want to lose the whole trip. Typically, more company uses the lot the cloud, the less risk company have with respect to a lost device or lost data, especially with remote wipe and backup to the cloud. Right? If, for example, a user stores or syncs key files to that cloud-based data repository, the users likely only lose minimal data, and this is perfect. This is how I travel. This is what it looks like. I do this all the time because I've had my laptop stolen. I had my cell phone stolen. It's a lot easier if I have low-cost equipment rather than something really super nice, and then I can do most of my work from the cloud on top of it. It makes my, my trips to some really interesting places a lot more fun. Right? Then I don't have to worry about it. Then sometimes my notebook just fails because I dropped it or I wore out or I bought too cheap a system and it just didn't have the life cycle or that mean time before failure didn't really quite cover it for me. So again, recovering from the desktop failure is ensuring I've got backups. If you're synced into the cloud, you're in pretty good shape and you're good to go. Virtualization is another way of doing it. If I'm doing a virtual desktop back to the cloud, the only problem is hotel bandwidth uh, may not be adequate for that. So just make sure that you are storing all of your data in the cloud, that it syncs to the cloud back and forth, uses some kind of TLS, VPN, some kind of tunnel for that data back and forth is good, and that you can't cache the password for it, and that you enable MFA for that as well. Really straightforward. If you're using Office web apps, um, that makes it even easier because everything can be stored back um, in the cloud as well. So everything now is pretty much so geared for that. Right. All of the subscription model of your Office 365, your Google document sets, and everything else, they all store on the cloud now. So it's really not as big a deal now as it was, like, say, 10 years ago. So things you can do, and again, it's all just architecting that user experience to make sure that it happens. Um, sometimes your internal Blade servers can fail, and your servers can fail just like notebooks or desktops can fail. And again, normally you won't even see it, but if you do, if you're working for the virtualized desk, data center in your own environment, these can come and go real, really fast. You just need to make sure your procurement, that you've actually got some hardware just hanging out ready to go, and you may not have that. Network failure, this is kind of a big one for home users. My network goes down at 2 o'clock in the morning every day to get some kind of update from, from my provider. What's interesting about that is it's really regular. So that's kind of interesting, but what happens is that I now have to schedule any work around that downtime. So it takes about 15 minutes for my provider to push whatever update they're pushing down to my router. And so if I'm lecturing, if I'm training at that time, I need to make sure everyone's at lunch at two o'clock in the morning, for me at least, that's my time. So network failures, networks go down, networks get pushed down, processes from the providers, you know, we're all working on our cell phones as a hotspot. All this stuff can fail. So just make sure that you've got really good bandwidth somewhere. Or you've got some kind of backup somewhere. Make sure that you're using some kind of VPN software that works well with whatever device you've got. Uh, make sure that you've got more than one internet source. Most data centers are going to have one, two, or three or more backup um, providers to that particular data center. The cloud, you don't even need to worry about it because, again, if you're doing multi-region, multi-zone, high-capacity failover and everything else, you've already architected for all that. So network failure really isn't going to be an issue. Database failure, though, is. So data, again, sorry, this is going to be a really super long lecture. I apologize for that. But database system failure is a thing. So what makes this interesting is most of us are going to be using platform as a service. So we won't even notice when the bat, when if a database fails because of the service level agreement that we have with the company. We may notice a two or three or five minute downtime. The problem comes in when I'm doing infrastructure as a service. So I need to consciously, consciously think about what my backups look like for whatever database server I have and how I'm going to replicate data and how I'm going to promote the my my replica my replicas in case the primary database server fails. So this is a very conscious architecture decision that, that we're going to make here, right? So I'm going to have read replicas. I'm probably going to have one primary database somewhere in the world, and then I'm going to have read replicas. So if someone makes a new account, they'll make their new account at the Ashland, Oregon data center, right? But then that will replicate out to wherever it is. So if my user moves around and goes to Europe and then goes to the Middle East and then goes to Nepal, that they're working from a read replica, whether that is um, 
in Europe, they'll probably be working off a German data center. If it's in the Middle East, they'll probably be working off of one in UAE or Dubai. If they're in Nepal, they're probably going to be working off of Malaysia or they'll be working off of Japan, right? So my read replicas can be in all those places and actually be fairly reasonable in making sure that my users have a good experience along the way, right? That process reduces the the problem of losing data along the way. If you're doing something with like Active Directory, that's going to automatically happen if it's in Azure. Same thing with with um, Amazon or Google. So if it's a login thing, single sign-on or something else, that's usually taken care of by the back end. But if it's company data, you have to consciously figure out how you want to design around that whole process to make sure that if one company database fails, you've got read replicas out there that can be promoted to master and then you can get rid of that failed database, put another one in its place and go. If you're working IAS, you have to do that. If you're working PAAS, you have to architect for it, but understand that Amazon, Microsoft, or Google will be the one that takes care of that for you. iPhones, iPhones break, so do Android phones. Um, I go through phones on a fairly regular basis, especially depending on where I'm going and how I'm traveling. So few ways outside of redundancy to replace the impact of a phone system failure, and that really hurts, right? I've had phones go bad on me, and I can't remember my iCloud password. Nothing worse in the world because now I can't do MFA. <laughs> if I lose my phone, all my multi-factor authentication goes bye-bye. So that's a big problem for me, right? So just making sure that I remember my iPhone, my iCloud password so I can get that pull down from that image right and that's just anywhere that's just going to be anyone we always forget our passwords right so a few passwords that you really do need to remember um, one of those is your backup for your phone so you can always continue to do mfa otherwise you've set up mfa and if they lose that cell phone um, you basically are going to have a hard time with that person you're going to have to reset their mfa to a new device if they get a new device and so on um, and that's ugly especially if there's not a backup for that phone somewhere in iCloud or someplace else. So things to think about on that one, right? MFA can be a weak problem here. Now what's interesting though is that you've got systems, right, like Ring Central, that can kind of help you out if you need to do faxes and nationwide calling and everything else. You can also use Google Voice. You can use a bunch of other systems along that. But what's really kind of neat um, is that that whole idea of cloud-based phone um, really makes it much more interesting because you can actually tie that cloud-based phone to a physical device and if you lose your physical device you've at least got a cloud backup you can still do MFA and other things right it ex exists for phones faxes it does all the things that you would do um, the only thing you won't have is all of your apps right it's just more of a phone a way of dealing with text a way of dealing with phone calls and a way of dealing with faxes and other things right so it's neat and it's one way of making sure that your MFA will still work if you forget your iCloud password, which I have done in the past. And then risk mitigation. All right, this is the fun part of the job. This is where you can be using things like the Stride model and there's a bunch of other risk mitigation models out there. There's stuff from Accenture, there's stuff from PwC and everybody else. Everyone's got a risk mitigation process. So pick one that makes sense for you to use. The problem with a risk mitigation process is that not every company looks at risk the same way. So if you are nuclear power, you work in a highly regulated en environment. You have to meet all of those regulatory and legal requirements. Same thing with medical data, right? So you have very clear guidelines on what you need to do and what those probabilities are for that risk mitigation problem. If you're a colonial pipeline, right, which got ransomware, you didn't have clear federal regulation to help you define what was risk. So colonial pipeline actually believed that there was no risk. So they didn't put a lot of things in place. They didn't even have a chief information security officer. They had no one to deal with security except for maybe a couple of employees that thought this was kind of cool. So they didn't have a business continuity impact. They didn't have good backups. They didn't have a good disaster recovery plan when they got ransomware. So they ended up having to pay and they got some of that money back. But in the meantime, lots of confidence. You had runs at the gas pump. You had people putting gasoline in plastic bags. That was crazy time, right? So you need to think about what your ability to deal with risk is from not just your viewpoint, but from the company's tolerance and appetite for risk in the absence of industry standards, federal standards, or legal and compliance and regulatory issues along the way, right? 
most of us that deal with public data have to deal with GDPR now because it is the most restrictive privacy policy on the planet. Right? If we could, we would just work with the American policy, but we can't because we are a cloud computing provider. We have to deal with the public and the public is now entitled to GDPR. So we're usually going to want to go with the most restrictive policy or legal or regulatory framework that we've got. So that's how you're going to balance that idea of risk mitigation with where data exists, where data is used and processed, and where you're going to build all your stuff and everything else. Very consciously building out your risk mitigation as you go into building out your cloud architecture. This is a neat, fun part of the process of intention building out stuff that you need to build and understanding the difference between corporate risk tolerance legal risk tolerance and personal risk tolerance because we all do things different and companies sometimes will tolerate more risk than I personally am comfortable with but it's the company's decision in the long run on how that will be done and this includes disaster recovery right so disaster is going to happen again I live in a zone where there's fire flood and earthquake period so I know that whenever I build something here in the Seattle area I need to have that in mind Right, it's a remote possibility, but in all honesty, I'm probably going to do multi-zone. I'm probably going to do something that's on the East Coast, West Coast, and probably something in the middle of America, just to make sure that I can do something for an American company. If it's a global company, I've got specific places I'm going to go because that's where I want to build all my stuff and make sure that if one data center goes down, if one zone or region goes down, that well, the other zone will be promoted and it will take over master operations. I can come clean up the mess later on but I've got my company up and running and they're good to go. By integrating all those cloud-based solutions, man, I'm reducing costs for my client, I'm reducing costs for my company, I'm taking care of business, I'm making sure that everything is taken care of while reducing any potential risks and in a way that satisfies my regulatory and compliance and governance things that I need to do. That's the important part. You can make any kind of disaster recovery plan that you wanna have, but trying to match all those legal, regulatory, appliance, governance, and all the other things that make legal and auditing people happy, the cloud really helps out here. It helps out a lot because they're taking care of the majority of that compliance issue, so I don't have to worry about it. All right, so again, long, long one. I'm sorry about this one, but key terms right on this one. Business continuity, disaster recovery plan, HALON, right? Remember, sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Mean time between failure, mean time before failure redundant array of independent disks of RAID is when we're doing things. Service level agreements, you will live and die by your service level agreements with your cloud provider. Make sure you really understand them. A UPS systems, viruses, and again, disaster recovery, business continuity is huge inside the cloud space. You definitely want to make sure that you are in good shape and understand how it works and why it works the way it works. And understand that in some cases, it may be a very intentional design process, especially if you're doing infrastructure as a service, because you have to. All right, and that's it. That's it for this lecture. Thank you for sitting through this, and I will see you in the next one.